<laughs> so the story of Mattel half begins as I half did over in Poland <laughs> by way of Denver. We've got Ruth Mosco, okay, who was born November 14th, 1916 in Denver, Colorado, the daughter of a large Jewish family who had come to America from Poland in 1907 as the Moskowitzes. Okay. Moskowitzes. But that was far too radically Jewish for 1907. <laughs> so even by Ellis Island standards, which is where her name was changed to right. Moscow, the Moscow Mule, as they called her. The wrestling name. <laughs> She started as a mule wrestler. <laughs> Her dad was a blacksmith. Cool. Uh, would have gone great in Knott's Berry Farm. He would have had a job in Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> so the family ended up in Denver, where he was able to find railroad work, which is where Ruth was born. She was the uh, youngest of 10 kids. So by the time she was born, her mom was not doing that great. So, I mean... Who would be? Yeah. Uh, so she was actually raised by her 20-year-old sister with her actual parents being more like grandparents. Wow. To her. But really? I don't think it was like a Chinatown sort of thing. It wasn't a, a long-kept secret? Yeah, it wasn't like, why are grandpa and grandma breastfeeding me? Like, it wasn't that, that sort of thing. Right. Which is a question we've all asked our, <laughs> at some point in our lives. But Ruth didn't play much as a kid and didn't have many friends. She felt, quote, girl talk was, quote, stupid. Right. Uh, talking about hating women. <laughs> so she was kind of what someone of the day might call a tomboy. Okay. She didn't really like traditionally considered girl stuff. Instead, like any preteen girl in the late 20s, Denver did. She worked at her family's drugstore and she loved it. I bet. Not just because it had a soda fountain, which is why any normal yeah. child would have loved it, but because she was able to learn how a business worked. And that was apparently, she learned this was her passion. Was okay. Business. Running a pharmacy. This 12-year-old girl just walking around with a ledger, the hot new toy for a 12-year-old. She didn't want to play restaurant as a little kid. She wanted to be like, you can't buy any more Claritin D. You have to come back when the prescription's done. <laughs> Are you making meth? Well, she wanted to play restaurant, but she wanted to be the person in the back with a visor on. Like, <laughs> how did we spend so much on French fries? We don't even have any garlic dishes. What are we doing <laughs> all this garlic? Do we have to pay our waiters? <laughs> they make tips. That was her favorite game. They make tips. <laughs> they make tips. These were the seeds of what became her talent later in life, which was predicting market trends, innovation, and also she loved poker. Right. Meanwhile, there was another. Isidore Elliot Handler. I Isidore? I don't know. This is a Jewish name and I should know it, but I don't know how Isidore, because uh, okay. I'm thinking of Isildur. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also thinking of that, yeah. <laughs> the most Jewish name I could think of. Isildur, Aragorn. Be careful calling him Jewish because he does mess up. And it's like blaming the Jews for everything that goes wrong in Middle Earth. So careful. I'm sick of all of your conspiracy theories that the orcs are Jews, Greg. You're on a slip and side slope right now. <laughs> 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 so Isidore was born on April 9th, 1916 in Chicago to a different Jewish family who soon moved to Denver as well, which is where he was raised until these two kids were both 16 years old. Mm -hmm. They met at a high school dance in 1932 and were together for the rest of their lives. High school sweethearts. Love it. All I want is for them to get married and be happy. Which Ruth's family was not thrilled about because little Izzy was an aspiring artist and they didn't want her getting mixed with that particular genre of loser. <laughs> The two stuck together and went to the University of Denver, where Izzy studied design and Ruth, I presume, studied business or running a soda fountain. Right. In her sophomore year, though, Ruth took a trip out to beautiful, sunny Hollywood. Beautiful. And landed a job as a secretary at Paramount. Ooh. How? I have no idea. She was probably sitting at the soda fountain at Schwab's doing research when an executive said, baby, you've got what it takes to be a secretary. <laughs> the way you're writing everything down that happens, <laughs> you can make it to the top of the assistant pool. You can make it to the top of the bottom. <laughs> Why she wanted to do this, I also don't know, but she took the job. Maybe if things had gone differently, I think she probably would have, or maybe this was her idea, she would have worked her way up to be a movie executive and I would not have put that past her. Like, right. I'm sure that would have happened if what I'm about to say didn't happen. Right. So she moved out to LA and her little Denver simp, Izzy, followed her and enrolled at what was then the Art Center School of Design in Pasadena, now the Art Center College of Design right. in Pasadena. Pasadena. Beautiful Pasadena, California. They lived in an apartment in Hollywood. She made him go by his middle name, Elliot, because she felt Izzy sounded too Jewish. Uh, Ellis Island anglicized thyself. Am I right, Ruth? My God. Let us Jews from Middle Earth yeah. <laughs> just go by our birth names. Isildur, Legolas, <laughs> I want to embrace my traditional Jewish name, Gimli. <laughs> <laughs> They're all Jewish now. I'm, I'm just going to say that the, yeah, everyone, the, everyone in, is Jewish. Yeah. 
<laughs> Everyone is Jewish. A heaven. Except for elves, which are still wasps. <laughs> in June of 1938, uh, these two were married, Elliot and Ruth. So here they were in LA. She is secretary at Paramount. He an industrial engineer living in a middle-class home nestled in the heart of Hawthorne. I assume the heart because I could not find this address anywhere of where they lived in Hawthorne, but they lived in a house in Hawthorne. Okay. It probably got paved to make way for the Beach Boys house that got paved to make way for the freeway. So to satisfy that struggling artist urge he had, Elliot started designing things in their garage Ooh. where it all began. That's where I keep my car. This was the same garage. This was Disney's garage. This was Steve Jobs' garage. This was Green same Day's garage. garage. Yeah. All the same garage. And the garage gets no credit. And no one remembers the garage. <laughs> they should have a garage hall of fame where it's where it's like the Heritage <laughs> Square Museum, but they just wheel in all of the garages from where all of these major companies were yeah. founded. <laughs> Honestly, I would pay good money I'd to go to that. Money. That would yeah. be pretty cool. I'd go up to uh, Bezos' garage. <laughs> 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 Two. Go to Elon Musk's garage where his dad gave him the deed to the sapphire mine or whatever <laughs> in South Africa that he turned into... Uh, his awful life. But um, Elliot started designing things out of the, their garage out of a hot new synthetic substance sweeping the nation. Lucite. Lucite. A type of plastic. What a beautiful child's name that is. <laughs> a Jewish child's name from <laughs> Middle Earth. What a dumb franchise. <laughs> that uh, we joke that someone could be named Lucite and it makes total sense. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think it's a dumb franchise at all. So he was making light fixtures out of Lucite and it was just a creative outlet for him. But Ruth, the shrewd businesswoman stuck in the career of a secretary, saw that these were really good. These light fixtures made of Lucite and suspected people would pay money for them and pay money for them people did. In 1938, they started selling them under Elliott Handler Plastics, uh -huh. which had an address listed at 3030 West Olympic in Koreatown. But I don't know what that was because he was making these out of the garage. Maybe that was just like a I don't know, like where they got their mail. I don't know. Some scheme is going on. They made some money. But then in 1941, two things happened. First, their daughter was born and they named her Barbara. Hmm. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. The Perhaps. second thing was they started a new company with a guy named Zachary Zembi. Oh, <laughs> is, we love alliteration. We do. We're pro alliteration on LA Meek. Yeah, right? you can be an old comic book hero or radio. Or villain. Or villain. Uh, and as it turns out, more, more villain. And this new company with Zachary Zembi, they would be selling jewelry that Elliot would design made out of, once again, Lucite. The mm. company was called Elzac Jewelry, taking the first letters of each of their names, Elliot Zachary. And this weird little business apparently made them millionaires, but also uh, an interesting naming uh, method. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So it made them millionaires. But after just a few years in 1944, they had a falling out with the Zach part of the business right. and left the company to start a brand new one selling picture frames made of, you guessed it, Lucite. Lucite. <laughs> Once again. Once again, the old culprit. They started this one with Ruth's friend, Harold Matt Matson, and they used that same naming scheme and took the first few letters of Matt and Elliot's names and founded Mattel. Matt, ah. Al, Matt Elliot Creations. Right. The business was going well, and Ruth even managed to land them a contract with Douglas Aircraft to make die-cast models of their Douglas DC-3 airplanes to give as Christmas gifts to their clients. So money was just rolling in. And then... World War Part the Second one hit, and Lucite, I think, literally needed to be melted down to bullets. Oh my God, literally? They Not one of our jokes of they needed to turn chocolate into bullets. Like, yeah. they literally need Lucite to make war machines, so they couldn't make these frames anymore. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> the joke is now joke dead. Is yeah, it's too meta. We're going to have to incinerate this joke and form it into a new joke. So to cope with this lack of Lucite, they had to resort to making picture frames out of gross old world wood. Ugh. Ugh. The kind of stuff that termites <laughs> Termite food? <laughs> they make things out of that? Oh my God. Would they knock a redwood down to build this picker frame? Gross. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where birds... That's bad for the food. environment. Keep making things out of plastic. So all the... How can I get cancer from a tree? <laughs> Watch me. Yeah. So all the while, lest we forget, World War Double was raging. So yeah. Elliot was drafted, thankfully only into the National Guard. Cool. So he was stationed at Camp Roberts in San Luis Obispo during the week. And on the weekends, he'd come all the way back down to Hawthorne to make picture frames. So this was how their World War II went with their son being born in 1944, who they named Kenneth. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. Odd. But Elliot started getting bored with just making picture frames. So with the leftover scraps of wood they had, he started making dollhouse furniture. Weird side hobby, but people loved this. Yeah. Like, uh, have you, you haven't seen The Wire. Uh-uh. Well, one of the characters, Lester, uh, he's like always making doll furniture. <laughs> and that's like his cool little quirk. That's cool. This also... Mattel started the crack epidemic. Um, so so much so that they converted 
it's not the crack epidemic, but people loved his doll furniture so much so, and also his crack, <laughs> that they converted an old Chinese laundry building in South Central at 6058 Western as their manufacturing plant. Okay. In 1946, Matt Matson, in a Stuart Sutcliffe level of bad decision making, had to cash out of the company Yikes. due to health issues, and now it was just Ruth and Elliot. He with a love for design, mm. she with a love for business. Right. This is where Mattel really begins. In 1947, they moved to a new building at 5432 West 102nd Street in El Segundo, right next to LAX, but it was time to refocus the company. After the Second Great War ended, the Great Roar began, and that roar led to a boom, a baby boom. Okay, boomer, but also, okay, business? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Stop. The last few sentences were just like a weird hopscotch to a weird punchline that took everybody off guard. A ton of new babies were being born after the war, and Ruth correctly observed that there wasn't really a mass market for toys. Right. You'd get a toy in a toy store, but there wasn't really, it was like, you know, it was elves. Elves and Santa Claus were making them. Right. They were- Let's put away the joke of uh, Santa and the elves, okay? okay yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they only make stuff for Christmas, but, you know, there wasn't mass produced toys. Right, right, right. So to keep up with the massive amount of population shooting out of the hospitals, something had to be there. Making dollhouse furniture was only a small jump away from making dolls. Right. So Ruth and Elliot decided to try to fill this niche that she believed was just appearing. Plus, another company was encroaching on their doll furniture business and they wanted to get out of that. But from that, they vowed that whatever they ended up making, because their dollhouse furniture was being basically knocked off, they decided whatever we make it has to be unique enough that it wouldn't be easy for a competitor to steal the idea sure, from you. Yeah. But they didn't do dolls just yet. The first thing that they seemed to be doing were something called a birdie bank, which was like a little bird. They would drop coins down a chimney into like right. a piggy, not a piggy bank, but a birdie bank. Birdie bank, yeah. And a, I like to make a little doll, please. <laughs> oh no, what do you do with all the seeds? You got to throw a meatball up in the <laughs> air and the bird will fly away long enough for you to get your money back. <laughs> and this was synergy. Whammo synergy. And then the other thing they were doing was a make-believe makeup set, which who can imagine what that is? Yeah. Uh, but then they seem to focus on making affordable music boxes. Okay. At the time, again, like music boxes were like a fine European luxury import sort of thing. So they figured out a way to make them cheap and then put them into things. Okay. So this led to their first big hit in 1947 called the Yuka Doodle. It was it was a little ukulele that you could play, but it also had a crank on oh, the side. Oh, I've seen those before. Yeah, that you could crank out some music box yeah, music yeah, yeah. with. So it was a very popular, and then they followed that up with a little plastic piano. But from this, they learned a hard lesson in quality control because they cheaped out on part of the music box mechanism and they ended up losing a ton of money. So they vowed from then on to only make quality things. Mm-hmm because you're going to lose money. What a, what a wild idea that yeah, is. Yeah, who, who cares about what the customer wants? We're going to lose money because yeah. they're going to complain. Uh, they ended up selling over 11 million oh y- yuka doodles God. by really? 1957. They were churning out some toys for the next few years and they were doing well, but then came 1955 and they made a business move that separated them from, hey, remember that self-playing ukulele from the 40s? No, me neither. To, hey, Mattel. <laughs> and it was spelled... M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. The Mickey Mouse Club went on TV. Uh And Ruth Handler had a crazy idea. (laughs) Let's stab Mickey Mouse to death. (laughs) What if we break into a live broadcast? (laughs) With a mousetrap and we kill him. (laughs) So up to this point in history, there weren't really advertisements for toys. TV was new and that was all advertising toothpaste. Radio was all about blue coal. Uh, Blue coal, Senka, Lipton's iced tea. Lipton's iced tea. The shadow. Yeah. The shadow's just a commercial (laughs) for Orson Welles. (laughs) For the concept of justice and Orson and Wells. <laughs> So stuff for toys was like in the papers and stuff like that, but only really around the holiday season. Sure. Or in like window displays. That's how people would see like, oh, mommy, I want, I want a yuka doodle. Oh, the hula hoop, mommy. (laughs) Mommy, please. All my friends, I see it, mommy. Buy me the slingshot. I'd love to send meatballs up to our raptors. (laughs) So Ruth wondered what would happen if there were commercials on TV for toys year round on a show watched exclusively by children. You would make all you, the money there would, you would be. become. This was the gamble Ruth and Elliot were willing to take on Mattel to advertise on the Mickey Mouse Club TV program to the tune of five oh 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 thousand dollars American. Almost had it. <laughs> no, you almost had it. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have Disney's innovation of how to spell. <laughs> sorry, the Sherman Brothers aren't writing for me. <laughs> 
half a million dollars in, the, in 1955 for a full 52 weeks of commercials. That would be today around $5 million, which at the time was the entire value of the Mattel company. Jesus. But what toy would they advertise first? Why the Mattel burp gun, of course, an automated cap gun that looked like an AR-15 that they were selling <laughs> to children on the Mickey Mouse Club. And Mickey approves. <laughs> and they use their slogan, you can tell it's Mattel, it's swell. Oh, okay. So this was an unheard of gamble and could have destroyed them forever. But of course, it didn't. Yeah. It worked incredibly well and changed toy advertising forever, much to the distress of parents all over America. It skyrocketed Mattel into the stratosphere and they've never come down even 70 years later. The power of the combination of toys, Disney, and showing kids toys they don't have. They, that That is a recipe for success. That is such a great idea. It it's seems crazy. obvious. Yeah, it seems, it obvious. seems obvious now, but to have to stake everything you had on it, pretty scary, but yeah. obviously it worked. So they followed this up with more toy guns. In 1957, then they hopped onto the Western craze and made some toy Western guns complete with launching bullets. You and I would have wanted our parents to buy us all of that. There's a toy coming up that I still think about like, God, I would love to play with some right now. So also in 1957, they released the corn popper, which is the thing that you push and the balls in the bubble like fly around. You sure, know? sure. Yeah, got to have my corn pops. Corn popper. Yeah, I got to have my corn <laughs> popper. They also uh, released a xylophone and snap Cute. lock beads, you know, like, kinda, oh, yeah, yeah. Snap, they're beads that snap together and you kind of sure, like, twist a, them. That, that'll keep me occupied for an hour. Sure. <laughs> then in 1959, they released the safety school bus, which is an ancestor of the little people toy line. Oh, OK. Yeah. So that's where that started. That's cute. But 1959 was notable for another reason. Yes, this is the moment. Many of our listeners have been waiting for. What's the year again? 1959. Okay. A few years earlier, Ruth had been watching their daughter Barbara playing with her dolls and noticed two things. The first was that she needs boobs. Uh, the f the first was that <laughs> big pointy boobs. The first was that she tended to play with the paper dolls because she was able to change their outfits. Mm -hmm. Limitless possibilities. Like sure. you can put a, this doll in anything you want. The second was that she would pretend that the doll, like her mom, had a career or was in college. Right. This wasn't something you could do. She's in computer school right now. She's a secretary at Paramount. <laughs> this wasn't something you could do with three dimensional dolls because they were all three dimensional dolls for girls back then were either dolls of babies or of moms caring for babies yeah 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 um have you seen the commercial for the movie no i haven't you'd you'd really like it it's pointed directly at you but it's a bunch of little girls playing with those like old victorian dolls and then suddenly there's a barbie and they're like they throw it's very Wait, this funny. is the commercial for the movie the movie and it, the commercial for the movie is a commercial for barbies it's for the concept of Barbie, but it's played as if it's 2001. Like the monkey seeing the... Oh, that's funny. It's very I, good. I gotta see it's this. It's very good. It flies up in the air and it comes down like a Malibu dream house. Yeah, like a, her Ferrari. <laughs> the, the bone is the little doll flying in the air and it's very... But what does it come down as? I don't remember, but it, it might not come... No, it does come down. It does come down. I don't remember. Well, if it's like Mattel, it never came down. Well, a few times it did. <laughs> uh, we'll get into it. It's a Super Bowl. It came down a couple times. <laughs> it crushed a car in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so the dolls at the time perpetuated the idea of motherhood and yep. nursing of children to young girls who at the time were supposed to only do that when they grow up. But I want to try fast cars and live in Malibu. <laughs> then on a vacation in Switzerland, Ruth got her hands on a Build Lily doll, uh -huh. which were not Build, it's B-I-L-D-L-I-L-L-I, -L -L a Build Lily doll, which was like a German line of plastic dolls of like a slender young woman who everyone keeps describing as sexy, which I find very weird because like, She's not a Cabbage Patch Kid, but she's not like a sex doll. Right, like right, right. Like she's somewhere in between the spectrum of doll. Sure. Like, uh, in terms of attractiveness of a doll. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about you right now. <laughs> the most attractive thing is a Cabbage Patch doll. The way you phrase it is like, she's not a Cabbage Patch Kid. I'm like, what, what do I, what? Huh? <laughs> I mean, she's not one of those gross sex dolls. She's like a Cabbage Patch Kid. But like. <laughs> she's sexy like a Garbage Pail Kid. <laughs> <laughs> a Cabbage Patch Kid you'll take home to mother, but yeah. a Garbage Pail Kid you'll just have some fun with it. That's, that's a bedroom a material. Night. <laughs> but like, she's just kind of European. Like the, sure. the way, like people keep describing the build Lily as like, this is like a pornographic doll. But like, it kind I think there was like a comic strip based on her where like she would sometimes be in like a nightgown. Okay. But like, it was not like, this was not a sex thing. Like it was just a weird kind of European doll. Like sure. it was kind of, I guess kind of sexualized, but it wasn't like It's a funny sex that thing. in the 50s, they thought if they loosened up a 
little bit, it would be like she had like eyeliner. Chaotic. Yeah, <laughs> it, they thought it would be chaotic Caligula everywhere. Yeah, but when they loosened up, it just shows in that era they they thought eyeliner and night gowns was like this is a porno. This is a, this is a slippery slide. <laughs> this, uh, this is, is a, a slip and sli- a slip side slope. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Ruth got her hands on one of these and formulated her big idea. <laughs> she got two hands on one. Of these. <laughs> so she would combine the customizability of a paper doll yep. with the sturdiness and appeal of a less sexy version of a plastic build Lily doll. Okay. It would be a doll that wouldn't just be raising kids. It was a doll that wanted more. Right. A doll that was a young independent woman that worked for a living and would show little girls that as Ruth put it, a woman has choices. Hell yeah. A doll that could be customized to show all the different jobs a girl could grow up to get. It was meant to be a feminist inspiration. She designed it uh, and also had boobs. She designed <laughs> it for, which is, I'll, I'll get to it. We joke around around about the boobs the boobs were like a, a sticking point I know for that. a lot of uh, not to put <laughs> you know not not for two men to put to find a point on it but <laughs> two fine points um <laughs> I know that it's going to be coming up because you never talk about that and you've already referenced it enough times like he's had to write that on paper so it's stuck in his brain now and he can't stop thinking about it not to be gross about it I'll get to her big old teeters but <laughs> But not now, Craig. Not now. So she designed these dolls with the big old honkers. She designed it for three years. It took most likely with a guy named Jack Ryan. No relation. Um, (laughs) He has a job we can't really talk about. He had to infiltrate part of Germany to get this doll. G.I. Joe's kind of based on him. (laughs) So this guy, Jack Ryan, who later sued and was awarded $10 million for claiming he actually invented the the Barbie. Yeah. Uh, This doll. A guy named Jack Ryan came up with the idea of... (laughs) A doll. Iconic feminist doll. Uh, Ironically, Ruth Handler came up with Jack Ryan and she sued Tom Clancy. (laughs) Most likely what happened is she came up with it. This guy helped her design it. Sure, Uh, sure. But, you know, whatever. In 1959, they were ready to release an 11 and a half inch tall plastic doll of a young woman in a black and white striped one piece swimsuit with eyes that glanced to the side and Audrey Hepburn hair that came either in blonde or brunette. Redheads were added. uh, Redheads need not apply until 1961. Call me 1960. Uh, she was a teenage fashion model from Willows, Wisconsin, oh, and really? her name was Barbara Millicent Roberts or Barbie. Love it. Named after Ruth and Elliot's daughter, Barbara. That's super cute. Her middle name is Millicent? Millicent. Barbara Millicent Roberts. Barbie Millie? Barbie Millie Robbie? Bobby Millie Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Barbie Millie Bob. Bar- <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird that this like heavily Jewish family made the waspiest yeah. <laughs> possible toy imaginable. Around their Seder dinner, they, <laughs> they announced that they're making Barbie. Barbie's terrified to tell people who her parents are. What if Barbie, Barbie's actually Jewish. <laughs> What do you mean you don't know what Christmas is? She's like, I know what it is. I just don't celebrate it. We've got Inquisition Barbie. We've got Converso Barbie. Barbie who has to pretend she's Catholic. When you were talking about the rack, I thought you were talking about something else. (laughs) Nice rack. What's this weird bed? Yeah, Barbie who has to pretend that she's not Jewish so that she'll get into college. Um, No, I don't know what Manischewitz is. And I don't know how (laughs) bad it tastes. Ew, gross. I like Coors. (laughs) Uh, can I come to the monster truck rally with you? I'm a big fan of the guy who's on the cross. He's neat or whatever. Who makes him? <laughs> who's he dating? What cars does he have? He's not wearing any clothes. Let's dress this guy up. They released a few years after Barbie, uh, Barbie's friend Judas, the, the line. <laughs> The Judas line of toys. So named after, yes. named after the doll. Elliot was against the Barbie doll. Why? Because he felt that no mother was ever going to buy her daughter a doll with breasts. Okay. But so here's the thing. To Ruth, the breasts were one of the most important parts. You've said it, Ruth. Wait, what is the line in the Goonies? It wouldn't be here if it wasn't. So he didn't like the idea that Barbie had boobs. He, I don't know if he didn't like it. I mean, who wouldn't? But <laughs> uh, I think his arguing is like, this is pornographic this is uh, sure maybe Ruth, too much this sure. is 1959 <laughs> the wasps aren't ready for this uh, sure we jews love this but <laughs> can't get enough of this but uh yeah th- he just felt like this is not a good business idea sure it's maybe too mature for little girls yes people will not want their kids their little daughters and probably especially their little sons yeah, their little gi joe seeing this <laughs> all the good little gi yeah. joe you either grow up to be a build lily or a gi joe <laughs> G.I. Joe met Bill Lilly (laughs) after the war, but that's a different story. Uh, So she felt, though, that it was important for girls to see a doll with breasts because it would show them that 
that's, that's normal. Like women have breasts. That's normal, yeah. and it's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed by. I absolutely agree with her. All of these not to be a perv, but <laughs> I absolutely agree that it, you need to show like, oh, your body, your body. This might happen to your body. Shouldn't be ashamed of that. <laughs> um, all that's what I say whenever I see a woman. Did, did I not? <laughs> should I not say that? All these good feminist intentions of Ruth Handler that not long after this were the focus of people who felt the image and ethos of Barbie were actually anti-feminist and harmful to little girls, which are also absolutely valid sure. complaints. Sure, sure, sure. People felt that it created a false, unattainable ideal of women that no girl could possibly live up to. Just her physical appearance alone, which if you were to transpose her measurements onto an actual human, it's physically impossible. Unless like, you're Vampyra. Nobody. Not no. even not even Vampyra. <laughs> this perfect specimen. Uh, but she's not human. She's not. Oh, that's right. She's not human. She's a vampire. Um, but it's just not possible. Like, your legs yeah. cannot be that long. Sure, sure, like, sure. your torso cannot be that small. But I'm sure that she wasn't thinking like, oh, little girls are going to compare no, themselves to... No, that's the the thing. She was not thinking that. She was thinking of these other things. Those were unintended consequences with good intentions. She had to beat one hill and didn't know that there was a mountain behind it. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, she completely leveled this hill not knowing there were a bunch of dwarves living in it. (laughs) All of these points, fair and true, but also what Ruth wanted to achieve and did achieve were also fair and true. The company has rectified a lot of the shortcomings over the years. So Mm -hmm. Barbie is a very complicated toy, but I'm not going to get into that any further today. For that, you're going to have to go see Barbie in theaters this coming this sometime. So coming this future. <laughs> uh, so back in the Daniel timeline, Barbie hadn't even been released yet. Mm-hmm. Elliot didn't think it was a good idea, but she took it to the New York International Toy Fair in March 1959 and nobody there thought it was a good Aye. idea either. This rattled her. Like she was got no support, not even from her husband. Like nobody thought this was a good thing, but she felt very strongly about it and she released it anyway. And within the first year, they sold 300,000 Barbies. <laughs> <laughs> if it was an instant hit, Ruth was right. Suck it, Elliot. Suck it, New York International Toy Hell Fair yeah. of 1959. But the real genius move by Mattel and Barbie, did, did well, you didn't have sisters, so you didn't grow up with Barbies. No, I had a uh, female cousin who I was close okay. to. So I did, I, I interacted with Barbie a couple times. Okay. I, I met her. And, I met her. Yeah, I, I, it's very cordial. I think I went to high school with Barbie. But yeah, my sister always talks about, because she always, she had a bunch of Barbies mm-hmm. and I was not allowed near them because... Sure. Uh, one time I you had a like, picture on the wall, like, do not serve this man. <laughs> do not Barbie this man. I had to say 500 feet away from every Barbie. <laughs> do not Barbie this kid. <laughs> Cause I guess like one time I like asked really sweetly to her, I was like, can I play with your Barbies with yeah. you? And she's like, yeah. And then I immediately ripped its head off. <laughs> So I was not allowed near the Barbies. Listen, I'm on their side. That's fair. You're a monster. Well, who's I bet gonna- you bit it off like you were Ozzy Osbourne. Well, <laughs> Two. It was Bat Barbie that I bit the head off of. You, you Elizabeth shorted Barbie? Left her in two pieces. This is an unrealistic depiction of a woman. So I ripped its head <laughs> off. It was, I'm the feminist, Greg. I'm the feminist. So, okay. So, but the real genius move by Mattel with regarding Barbie was that the doll itself was sold at cost for $3. So they weren't making money off of the doll. Okay. But all the outfits and accessories were oh. sold separately and they cost between one to five dollars. And when you know it, each Barbie came with a Barbie clothing catalog. So all the profits on Barbie were coming from the add ons to Barbie. That is George Lucas level genius oh. in, com- in terms of marketing. It'll be coming up later. Oh, geez. The Phantom reference. This was the first time marketing had been done like this, and it was just printing money for Mattel. Yeah, like yeah, they yeah. were just raking it in, and everyone was happy except Barbara Handler, their daughter, who was 16 when Barbie came out and was teased mercilessly by the oh other kids at Hamilton High School near Culver City. Really? I mean, why would they not? Uh, You're Barbie. You're Barbie. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a millionaire. Yeah. I'm a millionaire's (laughs) daughter. I'm iconic. People tried to rip her head off whenever they got (laughs) near her. It was a whole court case. So by 1968, the Barbie fan club had 1.5 million members in the US. And Barbie was getting 20,000 fan letters a week. I don't know who those were going to. And and they followed through with Ruth's intentions for Barbie being like she could be anything. This is an ideal for girls to look up to. They released... Uh, college graduate Barbie in 1963. Mm-hmm. Congratulations, Barbie. Uh, magna cum laude, Barbie. <laughs> Astronaut Barbie in 1965. Surgeon Barbie in 73. Business executive Barbie in 86. Airline pilot, diplomat Barbie in 90. Barbie's run for president a bunch of times. She uh, must have ADHD and get uh, bored with uh, and get re-obsessed every two weeks. She's uh, Jane of all trades, but where are you the master of Barbie? <laughs> in 1962, they released the coveted Barbie Dream House. Oh, right. Okay. That was coveted. It 
yeah, for I was talking with Melissa about Barbies last night. She had a Barbie dream house. She yeah. loved it. Like the little girls all wanted a Barbie dream house. Yeah. Uh, in 1965, they added bendable legs and eyes that could close. Cool. And in 1967, that I that's why I went up to the Barbie and I closed its eyes. <laughs> with my I don't two want fingers you to see what's going to happen <laughs> before I ripped it. <laughs> uh, and in 1967, they had the twist and turn Barbie that twisted at the waist. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, what's that? Over there? Huh? <laughs> that, and then she could see me coming. <laughs> and they, they also... Look at my head. <laughs> I was trying to create a new Barbie. Off with her head Barbie. Yeah. Marie Antoinette Barbie. <laughs> and they also... Yeah, I, I brought my GI guillotine. <laughs> they also modeled her fashion styles in the 60s after Jackie Kennedy. Oh, wow. Okay. In 1971, they released the iconic Malibu Barbie, mm-hmm. which I think is where a lot of the negative connotations of Barbie today come from. Really? Of being like, you know, the, the blonde beach oh, right. dummy. Like sure. that, I think it comes from Malibu Barbie. Don't ask me. I'm a girl. <laughs> That's from The Simpsons. That's Malibu Barbie. No, Malibu <laughs> Stacy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, please. No affiliate. Yeah. No affiliation. Do you think it's related? But the, Were they referencing something? The, but also the Malibu Barbie, I think, was the Barbie where they moved it so her eyes now look forward rather than like coyly to the side, which was applauded by the people who thought, you know. Who, she should be side eyeing other dolls being like, well, what did you wear? Yeah. <laughs> The dollhouse today. You should be looking yeah. ahead, only concentrating on what's her path. Yeah, her path. How about you sweep your own porch, Barbie? <laughs> so, and it, the broom is not in, in the catalog. <laughs> 1980 saw the first black and Latina Barbies, Hell and yeah. in 1992 they released the best-selling Barbie of all time, Totally Hair Barbie, which had long blonde fried-out hair that went all the way down to her feet. Wow, top-selling Barbie of all time, which I think my sister had. Okay. Uh, sorry, had, not head. <laughs> well, she no longer had a head. <laughs> More recently in 2016, they also released Barbie's new body types of curvy, petite, and tall. Oh, cool. And of course, uh, where would Barbie be without her boyfriend who burst into her life in 1961? Ken, Ken, named after Ruth and Elliot's son to date the doll named after their daughter, which is weird, but I guess they well, I bet they were like, a, you haven't been picked on like your sister. Na- name the boy Ken. <laughs> no, please! <laughs> no, you're not just a doll. You date your sister. <laughs> People are going to pants you in the gym to make sure that you have genitals. <laughs> so you, you better start bulking up down yeah. there. In 1913, they gave Barbie a friend named Midge, and in 1965, Midge. a sister named Skipper. Sister, her sister's name is Skipper. Her sister, her little sister, she has three sisters, but the first one's name is Skipper. Skipper unfortunate. They also gave Ken a friend in the '60s named Alan, which was the name of the real Barbara Handler's husband, which makes things even weirder and yeah. grosser. Barbie and Ken broke up on Valentine's Day, 2004, which is a fight I would have loved to have seen, but got back together on Valentine's Day, 2011. So Barbie, obviously one of the most iconic toys of all time, sure. mega hit for Mattel, iconic, like, iconic, like truly, truly, yeah, like Mickey Mouse level iconic. Yes, they even put one in America's time capsule for the bicentennial in 1976. And if they just rested off of that thick-ass laurel branch for the next 60 years, nobody would have even minded. Right. But they didn't stop there. First things first, they moved to a bigger headquarters at 5150 Rosecrans in Hawthorne. Okay. Then they went public on the stock market in 1960 and even more money came pouring in. And then came a string of iconic toys. 1960, Chatty Cathy, a doll you could pull a string and it would say things like, I love you and may I have a cookie which makes the whole I love you thing sound manipulative. Um, <laughs> uh, they could have been two separate tracks, but for some reason, it's always the same track. It plays at once. Yeah. The pull string technology, revolutionary. This was the first doll to do that. Right. Chatty Cathy. That's crazy. My favorite part of Chatty Cathy, you know who did the voice of Chatty Cathy? Who? June Foray. <gasps> the voice really? of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Ah! I that was that. Chatty Cathy. This became their second most popular doll behind Barbie. Yeah. 1961, they released Rocka Stack or Rackus Stack? Rackus Stack, I think. Rockus yeah. Stack? I think Rackus Stack is what I've heard before. Yeah. Which is the it's the stacking rings. Yeah. 1965, they released the C and Say, which I just bought for my nephew. And to be clear, the year is now 2023. Uh, uh, is that the you pull the string and, and it, it's it a, the cow says yeah. the raptor eats meatballs. The Barbie says, don't touch my head, Daniel. <laughs> Clever B word. Clever B word. <laughs> the chatty Kathy says, well, I love you. I need to borrow money. <laughs> I love you. What's the expiration date on your credit card? <laughs> Also in the 60s, they released Baby's First Step, which was the world's first walking doll. Creepy. Also, creepy, creepy crawler. They released creepy crawlers. Mattel's responsible for creepy, creepy crawlers? crawlers. and inc- the, My favorite commercials. Yeah, and incredible edibles. They they did oh, that really? also. I wish I had sisters because that, that from the commercials, that was the only reason to have creepy crawlers was to throw bugs at your sister. And they'd be like, oh, God. We, we talked about this on Candy is Dandy. I used to eat 
what I thought were creepy crawlers. Maybe it was Incredible Edibles, but maybe they had an edible version of creepy, Incredible Edible creepy sure, crawlers. Sure. But I remember at a friend's house making those things, yeah. baking them, and then eating them. So I don't know what I was eating, but I was eating something. You were eating something that- That was shaped like a bug. Yeah. And I made. And I made it. I found it, and it was mine. <laughs> and you can't take this. You can't take, June and you can't take it out of my system. <laughs> so Ruth became president of the company in 1967, and they were the number one toy maker in the world. Mm-hmm. But what about Elliot? Well- Let's hear it for the boys. Elliot wanted to come up with a powerhouse iconic Mattel toy a la Barbie, but geared toward boys. Sure. Wait, what was that word? Gear? Well, Elliot brought together a team of car designers from General Motors and also rocket scientists who come up with designs for little die-cast toy cars that looked cool and looked fast. On top of that, they came up with a type of perforated plastic wheel that would spin really fast. And on May 18th, 1968... The first 16 models of Hot Wheels came You're out. Kidding. The Sweet 16, as they called them. Wow. Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels was their, that is, their boy version of Barbie. And it is. Yes. Yeah. And all we'll talk about the level of success Hot Wheels has had, but yeah. Hot Wheels is a big deal to yes. uh, a lot of people. You're looking at one. So the Sweet 16 models, they were the Beatnik Bandit, Cheetah, 67 oh Firebird, God. Plymouth Barracuda, Camaro, Corvette, Cougar, Eldorado, Fleetside, Mustang, T Bird, Volkswagen. Dodge Diora, Ford J Car, Hot Heap, and Silhouette. And I'm famously not a car guy, but Hot Wheels are so cool. They are very cool. I love how I used to have have a ton of them, and I still see them and think, like, that looks like so much fun. (laughs) And you don't even do anything with them. You just, like, hold them and you hold them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you'd get, like, a track. Yeah. But they wouldn't go on their own. No, you had to play. They were just little cars or, like, concept cars, and they were so cool. Beatnik Bandic is a great look. I think that's. Ed Roth's? It hits such a little boy sector in my brain. Like, still... Which is most of my brain is the little boy, <laughs> little sector. boy sector. You heard the things I said about breasts earlier. <laughs> you stopped this recording to eat candy. Yeah, I know that you're a little boy. <laughs> Greg, they're not supposed to know about that. <laughs> can we just play a quick game of Jacks and then we can keep going? <laughs> we're not the only ones who feel that way. No. They were another mega hit for Mattel. From what I saw in several places, they have overtaken Barbie as the top toy for Mattel wow. and are the number one selling toy in the entire world. With only, How many Hot Wheels would you estimate have been sold? Over time. Over time? Yeah. In the billions, probably. Eight billion. Eight billion. How many people are on this planet? Eight billion. Eight billion? (laughs) Coincidence? (laughs) Uh, So now Ruth and Elliot had their signature toys, and Mattel was untouchable. And then they made... A bunch of bad decisions. Oh, no. The 70s got off to a bad start for Mattel when their factory in Mexico burned down, fire purifies doll, yeah. in 1970. <laughs> and then a shipyard strike in 1971 compounded that, creating a serious supply chain issue for them. So they started losing money. Sure. To deal with this problem, and by that I mean keep their stock price high, their chief financial officer started cooking the books oh, and counting no. orders that had been canceled because of the supply chain issues as orders fulfilled. So they were lying. He did this apparently with Ruth and Elliot knowing full well what was happening until 1973 when they were forced to publicly admit that the company was down $32 million and the value of their stock plummeted. Mm -hmm. The company was investigated by the SEC. The CFO was fired and the banks dealing with Mattel demanded the handlers resign from the company. Ruth and Elliot pleaded no contest to the charges and in 1978 were found guilty of stock manipulation and misleading investors, were fined $57,000 each and sent to 41 years in prison. Oh my God. (laughs) Imagine if that's how the story ends. Oh my God. This was somehow suspended as long as they did 500 hours of charity a year for five years. That's somehow because they were rich. So that's, they would have been in prison for the rest of their lives if- And they don't get to design the prison. That's just, it's (laughs) just the way it is. And they can only take one toy in there with them. (laughs) Prison is hell. Uh, My favorite toy is this file. (laughs) My favorite toy is a universal, the big Alcatraz key that you can buy in the gift shop. They stuck with the company for another couple years, but finally cashed out in 1980 for $18.5 million, which seems very low. Yeah. But aside from the federal crimes of its executives, Mattel just made some bad decisions in the 70s and 80s. They were buying up a ton of other companies and products, which started stretching them kind of thin. Mm -hmm. In 1971, they bought the rights to Uno. Ooh. The card game. Yeah, one of my favorites. Also in 1971, they bought the Barnum and Bailey Circus. <laughs> <laughs> the toy. One of my favorite circuses. Yeah, they they owned the circus. Wow. One thing they didn't buy in 1977. We bought a circus. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, we bought a circus and it almost bankrupted us. <laughs> one thing they didn't buy in 1977 was the contract from Mr. Special Edition himself. 
George Lucas to make toys for Star Wars. Oh my God. They said no to him because there had previously never been profits from a movie license for toys and they thought it was just going to be a money losing endeavor. Oh my God. Yeah. That's, oh my God. that's another like, we don't want to sign the Beatles sort of situation. <laughs> that is, I'm like goosebumps from hearing that. Imagine who got fired for that. Like, oh. not like fired so hard. <laughs> that is literally like the kids in the late 50s, early 60s, every kid, well, not every little girl, I think, wanted Barbie, right? Oh, yeah. And every then in kid the 70- post-1977 <laughs> wanted something from <laughs> Star, Wars. Star Wars. I want a bosk. Yeah. <laughs> Every kid wanted a boss. <laughs> I want the big thing that the Jawas drive around in. <laughs> I want the trapezoid. Every frame you were able a, to sell a new toy. Yep. Every frame of a new hope. Yep. It's a toy. Hey, we're Mattel. We don't need that. Okay, so here's how they tried to rectify this. They bought the rights to the toys for American Graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> they bought all the rights to Willow. <laughs> Um, okay, so a few years later, 1982, they decided to make their own action figure line to compete with Star Wars. Sure. They came up with three prototypes. One was this jacked guy who had Boba Fett's helmet. One was a guy who had a tank for a head. And the third one that they ended up going with was He-Man. <gasps> Really? Which in itself is a Conan the Barbarian knockoff. Sure, 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 sure. He-Man was their response to try to make up for what they lost with Star Wars. And it made them $400 million a year for a while. But back in 1977, after losing out on Star Wars, they also had Mattel Electronics. That's what they started. Okay. Which would focus on making handheld video games. But when the young video game industry slumped in the early 80s, Mattel Electronics almost pushed the company into bankruptcy. Oh, my God. they almost had to close until they were bought by a venture capital firm in 1984 for a mere $231 million. But the damage was done. In 1985, they officially lost their spot as the top toy company and fell behind Hasbro. Hasbro is the, probably the one that got Star Wars? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they did. Okay. Uh, they, they fell behind the Star Wars toy company. <laughs> <laughs> They're only item is Star Wars. <laughs> they did nothing else. Well, there was a company that only made Bosk dolls Bosque and toys. even that became bigger yeah, than Mattel. They owned the ocean. All of it. <laughs> so the company had to tighten up. They had to downsize and refocus. And to do that, they decided to devote themselves to what they did best, making Barbies and Hot Wheels. Yeah. They started churning out some 50 new types of Barbies a year with 250 accessories. Wow. This kept them afloat until 1988. They were given a Star Wars-like opportunity, and they were not going to let this one get away. Uh They got the license to make toys for Disney. Okay. And just like that, they're back. Sure. Mattel is is... back. The 90s was just a flurry of getting back to what almost ruined them the first time, buying up other brands and companies and spreading themselves thin. First, they moved into their current headquarters at 333 Continental Boulevard in El Segundo. They're still there. Oh, wow. Really? They're in El Segundo? They're in El Segundo. Around this time, also, they bought Polly Pocket. They Mm. got a deal with Hanna-Barbera to make toys of all their characters. We don't have Han Solo, but we have Magilla Gorilla. (laughs) Okay, you joke, but I'd rather have Huckleberry Hound than a Han Solo toy. (laughs) And is Huckleberry Hound not the Han Solo (laughs) of Hanna-Barbera? They tried to get more into the boys' market by releasing things like Arnold Schwarzenegger action figures and Gak... In 1993. Don't say it like that. Like, I should be like, whoa. <laughs> Greg, you should say sit it down like, for this. Unfortunately, they. Had they had. <laughs> I loved Gak. I know, you're the type. <laughs> a slimy, a slimy a little sl- brat. In 1993, they bought Fisher Price for okay. over a billion dollars. That's a good. That's good. 1994, they bought J.W. Spear and Sons, who owned the international rights to Scrabble, and also the Kranz Company, who owned Power Wheels and Whammo. Okay. In 1995, they bought those sexy Cabbage Patch Kids. (laughs) Uh, They also almost merged with their longtime rival, Hasbro, but luckily for us and for uh, just the free market, that fell apart. In 1996, they bought Tyco. Okay. 98, they bought the Pleasant Company who made American Girl. That's a big deal. That year, they also helped found the UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital, which is where they bring all the broken toys from Toy Story. <laughs> so it's mostly Sid is giving them all of their customers. <laughs> By the late 90s, they were making around $5 billion a year and were recognized, again, much like Whammo, like people called them Ruth and well, they weren't with it, but Back in the day, they did, but they were just kind of seen as like a good company to work for. Yeah. They offered in-house daycare. They had gyms for their employees, good vacation days. Fridays were all half days, and they were closed every year between Christmas and New Year. That's fantastic. 
just it seemed like a good and maybe still seems like a good company to work for. But then they just couldn't help themselves and decided to get back into the video game game. Good luck. In 1999, they bought the learning company for $3.5 okay. billion. Dollars. I've seen those commercials. The educational games like right. Carmen Sandiego, Reader Rabbit, and they immediately started losing money oh, and their God. stock tanked again. Yeah. They weren't going to let another video game almost ruin them, so they sold the learning company quickly and ended up losing almost half a billion dollars aye, in the deal aye, and aye. having to pay over $100 million in lawsuits by their shareholders who felt misled by this. This is considered to be one of the worst business deals ever made and it almost tanked them again so again they decided to refocus on the basics and that meant barbie yeah they started doing animated direct-to-video barbie movies that mm-hmm. did well but overall barbie was starting to lose ground to the hot new bratz dolls but <sighs> but then oh now God. that's a they have big that's a head i could rip that's off <laughs> You could really, really just get some satisfaction. Sure, it's a hate crime, but... <laughs> but then they found a Disney-level savior once again, and in 2000, they got the toy rights to both Nickelodeon oh. and Harry Potter. Oh, And just yeah. like that, Mattel's back once more. That'll do it. And that's kind of where Mattel stands today, just... Like they're big and yeah. they're popular. In yeah. 2000, they sued the band Aqua for their Barbie song. Why would I sue them? Uh, they said it violated their trademark and made Barbie into a sex object. The case was thrown out, but they sued them yeah, yeah, for yeah. like, our Barbie's not sexy. She just has breasts. Right. Uh, they can sue every blonde woman then. <laughs> and I do. How about, how about? <laughs> just don't tempt me, Greg. <laughs> in 2002, they stopped making toys in the US and moved exclusively to China. Mm-hmm. In 2011, they bought Hit Entertainment, who does Thomas the Tank Engine. Bob the Builder and Wishbone. Okay, Ooh, Wishbone. In 2018, they launched. I know of all those, I was like, oh, they do Wish- Wishbone. Wishbone? <laughs> um, <laughs> Dweebs. <laughs> There's one thing I love more than Hot Wheels. It's Wishbone. Where I get all my history lessons. <laughs> Wishbone. <laughs> I get my aggression out with Hot Wheels and I get my history from Wishbone. Um, in 2018, they launched Mattel Films, which is the company behind the upcoming Barbie movie coming sometime. Sometime Greta Gerwig is a perfect fit for that and I'm so excited to see it. In 2019, they released the Creatable Dolls, which were a line of gender neutral dolls. Cool. Mattel toys are sold in 150 countries, but alas, they are no longer the top toy company in the world as they lost that title in 2014 to... The Lego group. Oh, yeah. Once they start cranking those movies out, you're going to lose yeah. the Lego. Boo-hoo. They're not making $20 billion yeah. a year. They're making they're 19 16, million. Yeah. <laughs> so the handlers, meanwhile, post-Mattel, went on to do their own thing, mostly Ruth. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the early 70s, she survived breast cancer, oh, so she went on great. to start the Nearly Me company, which made synthetic breasts for women who had to have them removed because of breast cancer. Right. Betty Ford was one of their clients. Oh, wow, okay. Ruth went on to live until April 27, 2002, when she died of complications from a surgery for colon cancer mm. in Century City. Elliot followed on July 21st, 2011. The two also uh, had helped found the Temple Isaiah near Century City. Oh, wow. Their son, Ken, sadly died in 1994 of a brain tumor. And Barbara, the real human Barbie, is still out there waiting to invest <laughs> in an educational video game company. <laughs> 